Now what I thought I'd do is go through five cases with you. Um, and some of these are pretty straightforward. Uh, some of these are a little bit uh, more subtle, um, but hopefully they illustrate, I think, some of the benefits of doing genetic testing. So the first case, um, naturally, is a child of a physician. Uh, it's a three-month-old male, had failure to thrive, poor weight gain, was seen in GI clinic, uh, formulas were changed multiple times, still doing poorly. Uh, and then they decided to get some labs, and lo and behold, the sodium was 170, um, was sent to the emergency room, and additional testing showed um, a very low urinosmolality of 61, despite hypernatremia high urine output despite hypernatremia and did not respond to DDAVP, so no decrease in urine output um, so, or an increase in urine osmolality. So we were pretty confident that this was nephrogenic VI. We initiated standard therapy. We placed a G-tube for uh, mostly for fluid, really, um, but a little bit of nutrition. We limited the salt intake. Um, not much to do, of course, at three months of age, um, but as the child grew older, and then we place the child on a thiazide diuretic to try to further decrease their urine output. The differential diagnosis, of course, uh, most commonly it would be due to an ADH receptor defect, the X-linked form of the disease, 85% of the cases, um, but it could also be due to an aquaporin defect. There was no family history of uh, nephrogenic DI in the family. Um, so it could be the autosomal recessive form, Although, of course, the fact that it was a boy made it even more likely that it was the X-linked form. And uh, the parents uh, were interested in uh, doing some um, pre, pre-implantation uh, genetics and making a diagnosis. And uh, we sent them off. We wanted to send them off to our genetic, prenatal genetic counselors. And so we wanted to find out what uh, genetic form the child had. And we did genetic testing and this child had an ADH receptor defect, and that was, um, you know, the X-linked form of the disease, so that was very helpful to the family. The mom was tested to make sure that this wasn't a uh, new mutation, and she was positive for the mutation as well, and um, they are now moving forward with um, uh, their uh, prenatal uh, work prior to having their second child. Um, I should say, just show you that the, once we made the diagnosis, the child started gaining weight very nicely and is really doing quite well. I just saw this uh, little guy in clinic uh, earlier this week. Uh, not all of these are my patients, uh, but that, that one happened to be one of my patients. The second case is, uh, was referred to one of my colleagues. This is a four-year-old male, referred for proteinuria. Protein creatinine ratio was about 1.1. Had some polyuria and polydipsia, no salt craving. Had a normal renal ultrasound, normal complements, normal ANA, uh, normal calcium and creatinine ratio. The urine protein creatinine ratio was 0.67 uh, when seen in our clinic, and at that time had a microalbumin of 0.151, uh, 151 uh, milligrams per gram. And um, the family history was very positive for kidney disease, uh, a great-grandfather with end stage at age 65, a number of uh, maternal great-uncles with end stage kidney disease, um, a number of other people, even the mom developed proteinuria during pregnancy, although it, it self-resolved. Um, and we have a 24-hour urine pending uh, for calcium, because um, all we had previously was the calcium creatinine ratio, which was normal, and you all know that those are not particularly reliable on spot collections, um, and it turned out that this patient had dense disease, so I had a, a um, problem in the proximal tubule explaining the proteinuria, and uh, of course this is uh, an X-linked disease and had a, patho- a known pathogenic uh, uh, variant uh, in the gene, so we had a good explanation, somewhat of a surprise, um, although one could have suspected it a little bit. So the next case um, is uh, pretty straightforward. Uh, Really, this is a 16-year-old with a two-day history of abdominal pain and vomiting, uh, was admitted uh, to an outside, or went to an outside emergency room for dehydration, was found to have markedly abnormal labs, and then sent to us. Uh, Interestingly, the younger brother had been diagnosed with Gittleman syndrome at three years of age, 
Um, and uh, this 16 year old had a potassium of 1.9, an elevated bicarb of magnesium of 1.1. Um, we ended up putting the patient on some potassium and some magnesium. And not surprisingly, the, the older sibling had a diagnosis of Gittleman syndrome, so it was confirmed. And I think uh, this is a case where I think, you know, having a firm genetic diagnosis um, might have um, you know, led to some screening of, of siblings um, at an earlier time point. The next case uh, is, uh, I think, a good illustration of how genetic testing can maybe uh, save some healthcare dollars. Um, this is a uh, patient who was referred at age 12 for persistent glycosuria, um, was also sent to endocrinology, so sent to nephrology and sent to endocrinology. And we had seen the patient seven years previously and had done a pretty thorough workup um, prior to ready availability of genetic testing. And we were convinced that this was uh, primary glycosuria, uh, probably a genetic, the genetic form of the disease. Um, and uh, we had, you know, at that time, there was no evidence of diabetes mellitus, there was no metabolic acidosis, there was no hypophosphatemia, there was no proteinuria or amino aciduria. And we really provided the family with reassurance and told them um, that this was nothing to worry about and um, this was a genetic form of uh, glycosuria. Um, but of course, we didn't have a firm genetic diagnosis and they ended up seeing a new pediatrician who sent them to endocrinology. Uh, so they paid for a nice expensive endocrinology consult and the endocrinologist, of course, felt obligated to get autoantibodies and a hemoglobin A1C and actually, I think, sent them for genetic testing for um, uh, uh, Modi um, and, uh, and then also sent them to us. So uh, had a, a, uh, another nephrology consultation and we did the genetic testing and um, the patient was homozygous for one of the uh, two genes that classically cause renal glucosuria um, and was homozygous. It was, a very, it was considered a variant of unknown significance, so it wasn't necessarily a slam dunk that this was uh, the explanation, although given the clinical history and given um, the fact that, uh, that it was homozygous for this variant, we had a pretty high suspicion. Um, if we wanted to go further, we would have typically sent this patient to our geneticist who would have uh, done some uh, additional exploration on the effect of the of the variant on the protein um, and done some looking at uh, large databases um, but we felt that um, we were pretty content with that genetic explanation hopefully this child won't be referred for a consultation to endocrinology and nephrology again in six or seven years because we have a pretty certain diagnosis the final case is a very interesting one. Uh, this is a five-week-old um, who was admitted for failure to thrive, uh, had feeding problems and vomiting. And on admission, the sodium was uh, low at 132, the potassium was 6.1. And then uh, they didn't call us yet, but when the sodium went down to 129 and the potassium went to 6.6, .6, they called us. Um, uh, serum creatinine was normal, renal ultrasound was normal. The aldosterone level was sky high, 36.92, and uh, we in initiated treatment with uh, decanting the feeds with KXLate and sodium chloride supplements. It turned out that the older brother had a diagnosis of pseudo-hypoaldosteronism and was managed by the endocrinology service, but the endocrinology, endocrinology uh, faculty on call uh, was a little... Uh, scared about taking on a patient with a potassium of 6.6, .6, so asked us to take over this patient. Um, the older brother was managed just with sodium supplements and was actually weaned off of sodium supplements at age six. Uh, the initial aldosterone, I went back and looked at the records, was quite elevated at 6.52 in the older brother, but decreased on sodium chloride supplements to normal levels, and um, they took them off the sodium chloride. According to the notes, there was some salt craving initially, um, but then um, that seemed to go away, although I guess the kid probably liked to eat salty food, but not, not for sure. So what do you all think? What could be the explanation? 
Well, um, certainly sounds like pseudo hypoaldosteronism. Of course, there's two types. Type one, uh, the dominant form due to a mineral corticoid receptor uh, uh, genetic variant and the recessive form due to variants in one of the three uh, chains of the uh, uh, sodium channel, ENAC, in the collecting duct, the three, at least the three chains where uh, genetic variants have been described. Um, but the other possibility uh, in terms of pseudohypoaldosteronism would be Gordon syndrome or pseudohypoaldosteronism type two, which can be due to any of four uh, gene uh, variants. And um, these are uh, in general dominant. Um, and um, what was interesting in this case is that a, a variant of WNK4 uh, was discovered, um, but it was a variant of unknown significance, um, but it was heterozygous. And so it kind of sounded like that's what this patient might have. Um, but if you know about pseudohypoaldosteronism type 2 due to WNK4, um, this is really a gain of function variant. Uh, so it's something that causes uh, WNK4 to not be degraded as fast because it prevents its de degradation. So it protects WNK4 from degradation. Uh, the WNK4 then uh, causes the sodium chloride co-transporter in the distal nephron to be uh, overly expressed and overly active. And that's what causes Gordon syndrome. Also, it downregulates uh, the ROMK channel and the collecting duct, so that inhibits potassium excretion. And so um, because it's a, a, a gain of function variant, it tends to affect only a small segment of the gene. You can't just have a deletion of the gene. That would not cause uh, the disorder. You have to have a gain of function variant. And so what I did was I looked at the gene and looked at where the variant was in the patient, and the variant is described in the literature, and it wasn't in one of those locations where one would expect it. And so we did not think that this variant of unknown significance was of any significance at all. It was just a red herring, um, and that was supported by the very high aldosterone level, which one typically does not see in pseudohypoaldo, and also the clinical course of the older brother who responded nicely to sodium chloride uh, supplements, which would not be the therapy for um, pseudohypoaldosteronism type 2, which of course would be treated with a thiazide diuretic. So I think this is a great case for illustrating that um, when you get a variant of unknown significance, it could be significant, um, but it could be truly insignificant, a red herring. And if this patient had been treated for pseudohypoaldo type 2, that would have been the wrong therapy and it could have had deleterious effects. What's interesting in this case is we didn't find a variant that really explained why this patient had pseudohypoaldosteronism or why the brother had it. And so uh, despite screening for all the appropriate genes, and so this may be a case where it was not detected. It could be that uh, the variant occurred in a place where, um, in like an intron, where it may not be picked up, um, or some other area, or it could be that it was affecting a gene that hasn't been described. Um, but we're treating this patient just like the older brother was treated, and we will be following along. So one of the great things now, as I said, is that there's lots of genes to be screened, and there's now affordable ways for doing genetic testing. Unfortunately, it's still somewhat cumbersome. You can't just type in to your um, computer, the test that you want to order, and magically it gets done. Um, there's a lot of paperwork to be sent. Um, there's samples that have to be sent directly to a genetic testing lab. Um, uh, you have to get consent from the parent. And so this, we found, was a bit of a barrier and certainly made it uh, disruptive during clinic to try and do this when you're busy trying to see patients. So what we've done is we've really formed a great nurse-physician partnership in our practice, and this might be something that you might try in your practice to make getting genetic testing easier. 
Um, what we do is the physician identifies the candidate patient or our APP, or one of our APPs, um, and then discusses genetic testing with the family. You know, why we're doing it, what we might find, um, what, what unexpected things we might find, um, uh, potential costs, etc. And then if the family agrees, uh, the physician just communicates with the nurse and says, I'd like to do this genetic test. And then the nurse really takes it from there. Uh, they provide, they have uh, pre-filled out forms, uh, with everything that we want checked off. We always screen for variants of unknown significance since they may sometimes be significant. So that's something that I would recommend doing. Um, and that's all pre-checked off. Um, we then complete the parts of the form that we need to complete, the clinical, the clinical history, um, which is really just a, a few brief uh, words. Uh, then the nurse goes back and obtains the written consent. She then works with the physician and the family to determine the best way to obtain the sample. We either get saliva or blood. We mail kits to families if needed. If the family is having blood drawn that day anyway, clinically, we'll place an order in and uh, send the kit down to the lab. With the family or the nurse will facilitate that. If they're at home, she'll facilitate a way of getting it done. And really the nursing staff are doing all of the coordination. And so that's getting off of our plate. And so we can focus on uh, the selecting who to do the screening on and interpreting the tests. Uh, so once we get the result, we make sure it gets scanned into our EMR. We use EPIC, so it's available to everybody. Um, we share the result with the family. Um, and then if genetic counseling is indicated, uh, we uh, make sure that the family receives appropriate genetic counseling. And that, that process, this partnership with our nursing staff, has really made it a whole lot easier to get the genetic testing done. And so we've really been able to dramatically increase our genetic testing over the last two years through the combination of affordable genetic testing and a good system for getting it done. 